Shove it, man! All right, it's the hawk. I'm a man, or a bird, which is mostly known for ripping on TNA. But that's the name of the game, man. No, in all seriousness, big TNA fan, and I greatly miss the company. They're the highest of high flyers, the sexiest women wrestlers, a show filled with legends and up-and-coming wrestlers, and you never knew who could turn up. Yeah, it was chaotic, but it was never boring. If you, like me, used to read internet message boards back in the 2010s, you would constantly read that TNA was on the verge of going out of business. And that take's been done a thousand times. So how about we look at the second biggest take on internet message boards back in the day. The TNA roster sucks. And yeah, I might be guilty of helping that narrative too. But today, I'm going to change that. Because after Hulk Hogan joined TNA and we got through 2010, things did improve. In fact, the roster became so good that a large amount of the wrestlers from the roster from 2011 are still working for major companies. So if the roster sucks so badly, why are these guys still employed? TNA was actually building up some of this generation's stars, and they don't get the credit they deserve for the role they've played in that. I've chosen 2011 because I believe this was the strongest roster to be used to demonstrate my point. And to demonstrate it further, we'll also take a look at the WWE roster of 2011 and see where most of those guys are today. If we take this alphabetically, AJ Styles is the obvious first pick, Mr. TNA, the real face of the company. What hasn't already been said about him? I'm really happy for AJ because he was extremely loyal to TNA despite obviously deserving to be seen on a bigger stage. He's gone on to hold all the belts in the WWE, including the WWE title twice. I don't think anyone would argue with me about AJ Styles. He was the most obvious TNA guy who's done well for himself. But TNA also had Abyss, who was a good monster at one point in his career and he would normally produce some fun, hardcore matches. Unfortunately, due to the storylines he was used in, his character became a bit unbelievable. He was already on his way out at this point due to past injuries, but he still had some value in 2011. In terms of some cruiserweight guys TNA had, Alex Shelley, a great wrestler who could do some fun character work too, given the chance. He's not bad on the mic either. He went on to wrestle for WWE Japan and AEW, and he's back in impact now. He's seen as a very respected wrestler. He's someone I'm surprised AEW didn't sign permanently. Amazing Red, he's a guy that should have done more in wrestling. By 2011 his body was pretty beat up, but he's been credited by wrestlers such as John Cena and Will Ospreay for how amazing he was. Just breezing over the next inclusion on the TNA roster because it makes my video look invalid. They had a guy called Anarakia who was basically a cheaper cheesier version of Chavo Guerrero. Just forget he existed. Anyway TNA actually had Anthony Nice in 2011 when they tried to recreate their X division. Between 2016 and 2021, Nice was with the WWE, and in 2021 he signed with AEW. I think we can all agree that TNA had a wrestler for the future here. Angelina Love was one of the TNA's better female wrestlers. This was a time when women's wrestling wasn't so athletic, and Angelina did a good job mixing sex appeal with wrestling skills one half of the beautiful people, and she helped get TNA some of its highest viewership. So she definitely had a lot of value to the company. But ultimately, by 2011, her career was on a downward trajectory. And finally with the A's, Austin Aries. <laughs> Love him or hate him, you can't doubt his wrestling skill. In 2011 he was pretty low on the card in TNA, but man did he rise up quickly. He ended up being one of TNA's biggest success stories. A double did everything he could in TNA before signing with the WWE, where he had some great matches with Neville and tried to bring some personality to the Cruiserweight Show 205 Live. A double would still probably be employed there today if his personality didn't rub everyone the wrong way, and some other stuff too. WWE also had several wrestlers beginning with A, and to be honest, it hasn't gone so well for them. Aksana, a lady who I literally don't remember. Alex Riley, he's pretty much just remembered for being the Miz's sidekick and a man they tried to push several times throughout his six year stay. It's reasons like this that wrestlers should start out on the indies for years. WWE should be the pinnacle of your career, not where you start. Armando Estrada, just no. You could argue WWE were onto something with Alberto Del Rio, but look where he is now with all his legal problems. He ain't coming back from that. And Alicia Fox? I never thought she was any good. Talk about awkward looking in the ring. You could probably make a case that A.G. Lee did the best out of the A's, but she was only there for about half a decade, hardly one for the future. On to the B section, and Bobby Roode is the first TNA name. Wow, I mean what a star this guy is. He was also very loyal to TNA for a long time, even if the company was dying he stuck around. The second biggest TNA success story after AJ Styles, because he was nothing before he started with TNA and he came out as a believable main eventer. I thought WWE would do a bit more of him to be honest. He's kind of fallen back into being a tag guy. He's won three tag titles in a US title. Solid mid card guy for them. I believe he could do more but maybe injuries are starting to catch up with him. He's out of a neck injury right now. 
Brian Kendrick, he was in TNA in 2011, and I'm aware he was in the WWE before that, but he did wind back up in the Fed again after TNA. He had value in the ring, although I'm not sure what he was going for with his character work. He might as well have just played the part of a stoner friend, because that's all he ever seems to come across as. He could be quite fun in the ring though. WWE fans may not be familiar with a lady called Brooke Tessmarker. She was originally in the WWE as Brooke Adams, and TNA picked her up and slowly built her up. She was never incredible in the ring, but she did improve, and she had amazing looks. I'm surprised more hasn't happened with her, because she had star potential. TNA kinda pushed her as the new Velvet Sky, as she was a valuable member of the TNA roster for a time. Bully Ray, or Bubba Ray, started his first singles run around this time, and he did great. He showed he wasn't just a tag guy anymore. The Bully Ray character was hilarious and excellent, and it's a sad to see that WWE didn't let him use the character on their screens when he returned to WWE. Something about not glorifying bullying. But Bubba became one of the most valuable members of the TNA roster. As a heel, he was probably the best. The WWE B wrestlers are led by the Big Show. He was stale and boring. Other than being a larger than life attraction, he wasn't doing much else. He was probably good for the live crowds, but I certainly wasn't tuning in to see him. Brie Bella, just annoying and bitchy. Did reality TV, I think? Probably good for casual fans too, so I guess she has a worth. But what is her legacy in wrestling? Ugh, oh, we're really scraping the bottle of the barrel now. Brodus Clay, a big idiot who danced and was goofy. Pretty similar to the Big Show really, but fatter. Again, no one was tuning in to see him. Byron Saxton, he went on to be a commentator and he has no wrestling legacy. Let's just end these bees now before it gets any worse. Starting us off at sea for TNA is Chris Sabin. Just like his Motor City Machine Guns partner Alex Shelley, he's extremely respected in wrestling nowadays. TNA did try and push him as their world champion, but it felt forced and was a fail. But it doesn't mean he was a bad wrestler and he didn't have value. Not everybody can be a main eventer. As an undercard guy, you could guarantee a good match from him, and he was also good on the mic. He had lots of history in TNA and the fans loved him. And then we've got Christopher Daniels. Is my point starting to sink in yet about how OP the TNA roster was in 2011? Another guy who wasn't built to be a main eventer, but he was worth every penny if you went to watch the show live. He was just starting to figure out his character in 2011 after years of failing to connect with the audience. It's a shame he figured it out so late into his career. He went on to wrestle for AEW and no doubt his excellent work and bad influence helped him to secure the move to AEW. We finish on Crimson, the new Goldberg, except he wasn't as muscly. He looked like a half squeezed tube of toothpaste. Honestly though, if he hadn't been pushed so hard he would have been acceptable. At least he looked like a wrestler. He was a bit dull in the ring, but he could have been something for the future. He wasn't offensive, I'll leave it at that. WWE also had a strong stack of guys starting with C. CM Punk to name one, need I say more? Well I will. They had Christian, who also had more worth than he was allowed to show. And Cody Rhodes, one of the few guys on the WWE side of things in this video who truly has gone on to be a modern day legend. They also had... <sighs> Chavo Guerrero. He was good in the ring, but extremely annoying. And he was getting old at this point too, so not exactly one for the future. He was mostly involved in comedy stuff with Hornswoggle. Chris Masters. More like Christ Masters, because that's how you felt when you saw him. Not a good roster member. And Kamasho, the son of Haku. Very boring and hasn't done much in wrestling yet to prove anyone wrong. And someone's going to complain, yes I know he's in New Japan, I'm sure he's having some great matches there. Does that make him a star or a legend in the western world? He's not proved me wrong yet. And Kurt Hawkins? This guy has always sucked, just boring and bland. TNA didn't have many wrestlers beginning with the letter D. They had Devon Dudley. Yeah, he wasn't great when he was on his own. Douglas Williams though, perhaps one of the most underrated wrestlers of this period. He wrestled a British style, which was pretty different to the majority of the roster and it made him stand out. And he could cut a great promo and he had a cool finisher. They also had D'Angelo De Niro, the Pope, who was excellent in TNA at first and could have gone much further than they let him do. For like a brief time in 2010, the Pope was looking like a real star. WWE did have some more hope in their Ds with Daniel Bryan, and he's gone on to have a great career. They also had Dolph Ziggler, who's still employed today by the WWE, and he's done well. The same can't be said for David Otonka and Darren Young, both awful and boring. But perhaps no one was more boring than Drew McDonald, at least at this point in his career. He showed zero charisma, and yet he was being pushed down our throats. He was a long way off becoming the wrestler he is today. They also had Derek Bateman, who went on to be EC3. But he was nothing in the WWE if we're looking at it from a 2011 viewpoint. TNA made him into a main eventer, and then he screwed it up himself. The only TNA wrestler beginning with E is Eric Young, a man who was in TNA a long time and was eventually pushed with their top belt. 
He mostly played comedy heel roles for TNA, which has its place in wrestling admittedly. But I have to say, Eric did manage to break out of that routine eventually, rather than getting trapped as a comedy goofball. He also had a stay with the WWE where he got to show off a darker character. In 2011, he was still a comedy act, but every roster needed one, and he could still have a pretty good match if you wanted him to. On the WWE side, we have Epico. In 2020, he ended his decade-long stay at the company, and considering he was there a decade, what impact has he left on the company? That's a long time to do a whole lot of nothing. Evan Bourne was good for the WWE, although I feel like they wanted more from him. Ezekiel Jackson. Nobody could possibly ever want to see this guy again. And Eve Torres, who's nice to see, but it's nice to see her leave too. I've not included Edge because this was the year of his retirement from the Fed. Neither company had any wrestlers beginning with F. Francine would be turning over in her grave, and she ain't even dead. So on to the G's, and you can't get much better than the OG of the TNA knockout division, Gail Kim. There was no better women's wrestler at this time in wrestling, so TNA have them beat hands down in this area. They also had Gunner. It felt like TNA saw him as a bit of a project. He sucked at first, but he did get better, and by 2011 he was showing a bit more. He had a good look, but he was just a bit bland. He went on to be Jackson Riker in the WWE, and he had four years stay with the company before being released in 2021 due to a controversial tweet. He's not really either a good or a bad inclusion in the TNA roster, but the fact he got called up to the WWE showed his potential. The only G in the WWE was Gold Dust, and this act was as stale as a week old slice of bread in your mum's basement. He has worth because he's a creative guy, but no one was watching the show for old dust. Hernandez was the big Mexican Superman in TNA. He was pushed for years as a singles and tag team wrestler. He had some pretty cool moves and it was fun to just watch him throwing guys around. Unfortunately, it turned out all this throwing was a bit unsafe at times and some wrestlers did get injured. Nevertheless, he was a fun mid-card act and he was an important part of the tag division. Yes, some of those tag teams sucked, but he was always the best part of them. Now, the big question is, do we count Hulk Hogan? He actually wrestled three matches in 2010, but none past that point, so I don't know if we should. He was supposed to wrestle the Idiot Abyss, but there were so many back surgeries going on for the Hulkster at this time, it wasn't possible. He was most used as a management figure. Obviously, someone that could draw eyes to the product. He had his worth to the roster, although his worth wasn't as much as he was paid. I'd like to buy Hogan for what he's worth and sell him for what he thinks he's worth. In the WWE, we've got oh, the one-man rock band Heath Slater. Just a comedy act, although I think he was starting to be pushed as a more serious wrestler as part of the Nexus at this point. Either way, it sucks, and it demonstrates a weakness on their roster. How could you ever take this guy seriously? Look at him. Hornswoggle was another complete joke, and yes, I count him as a wrestler because he was always wrestling, for some god-awful reason. He was legitimately the reason I stopped watching the WWE. The amount of time, segments, and storylines dedicated to him made me say enough was enough. Another big L for the WWE. Another big L was Hunico, who wrestled both under that name and the Sin Cara name. He is known for his lack of charisma. Another weak roster member. One member who wasn't weak in the end was Husky Harris. It seemed like he might not make it, but he eventually transitioned into Bray Wyatt, and he's one of the few guys on this list that are still with the WWE today. Okay, now both TNA and WWE had a lot of wrestlers beginning with J, so forgive me if I keep this brief. TNA had James Storm, who went on to be a one-time world champion and could have done a lot more if they allowed him to. They also had Jay Lethal, who's done really well for himself. He's still wrestling and he's in AEW right now. He was helped a lot with the videos of him and Ric Flair training for the last match and all that. But now he's teaming up in AEW with a wild slap nuts appearance. Jeff Jarrett. Yeah, Jeff's in AEW, whoop de doo He never drew a dime in any of his previous companies, and now AEW can spunk some money down the drain on him. In reality, this man's career seems like it's never gonna die. Slapnuts continues to do well for himself. Another wrestler beginning with Jay was a certain Jeffrey Nero Hardy. He was a main event of the TNA, had some great matches. He could fit in any of their divisions. He's still wrestling too also for AEW, although he is suspended right now. Some people never change. And they just keep coming. Jerry Lynn is also signed to AEW right now, although not in a wrestling capacity. He's old now, but the fact TNA could still call him back in 2011 to wrestle is pretty awesome. Jesse Sorensen was also doing well for himself and seemed like a future star until his neck break in TNA. He has wrestled in the WWE and AEW since in the last few years, but he's not signed, he was just a jobber. The only downside to the TNA Jays was Jesse Neal, and he wasn't actually that bad, but he hasn't done anything since and there's Jackie Moore who was too old at this point. Things aren't so positive in comparison with the WWE. 
Jack Swagger. He has to go down as one of the biggest failures in wrestling. This guy was pushed so hard and nobody ever cared about anything he did. He just always came across as looking like a complete goof. Yes, he wasn't bad in the ring, but he wasn't worthy of the spot they gave him. JTG. Unfortunately without Shad, rest in peace. Nobody wanted to see JTG. Jacob Novak. Yeah, he sure sucked. Jinder Mahal. It keeps getting worse. Jerry Lawler. Oh, he wrestled 11 televised matches. Nobody wanted to see this guy wrestling in 2011. He was also involved mostly as a comedy wrestler. Feels like I'm saying that a lot. They did have John Cena though, but the problem is, despite the fact he's obviously the biggest star in wrestling at this point, he's completely unbearable and he's marketed towards little children. John Morrison wasn't bad either, although give him a storyline and it'll be the drizzling turds. Johnny Curtis, he played Fandango, who was a modern day glyph who was a modern day gifted Glenn Gilberti. How was he gifted? Again, who was tuning in to see him? The Usos certainly have a bright career ahead of them, but they were hated on for years. Sometimes you just gotta power through the hate. And finally, Justin Gabriel. No complaints, thought he was talented. On to the K-Squad. We start off with Kazarian. AEW fans will be familiar with Kaz. Just like Daniels, he took a long time to figure out his wrestling character, but he never let us down in the ring. And once he figured out his character, his team with Daniels was the best tag team in wrestling at that point in time. Kazuchika Okada. Calm down, comment section. Don't get your knickers in a twist. He wasn't known to the Western audience, so TNA didn't push him like he was a star. In fact, they pushed him like he was a joke. The Rainmaker went back to Japan after this and became much better. But yeah, TNA had him on their roster in 2011. You could call that a massive win. Another comedy wrestler for TNA was Kevin Nash. He rarely wrestled, but most of the backstage skits were hilarious. And it was actually adult humour. Who would have known that that could appeal to some people? Keeping up the legendary wrestler trend, Kurt Angle was here in 2011. TNA pretty much pushed him as their top star for years, and rightfully so. And to round off the K-Squad is Kid Cash. He had changed his style a lot from the early days of TNA. His heel mic work was great, but I doubt anyone wanted to see Kid Cash in 2011. Just look at him, he's not visually appealing. We start off our WWE comparison with Caitlyn, a woman who did so little in wrestling, I don't even know who she is. Kane. He was past it in 2011, I don't know, probably. People will have to let me know in the comments section, was Kane past it in 2011? He must have certainly lost his aura by this point. I wouldn't describe him as a great roster member by 2011. Kelly Kelly, yeah. Karma, this was Awesome Kong who was in WWE briefly. That could have been good for them if it had worked out. Do you know which other TNA wrestler was in WWE in 2011? It's Kevin Nash. He left TNA who worked to restart the main event mafia, but Nash instead chose to come back to WWE and enter the Royal Rumble. Kevin Nash is always gold on TV as long as he's not wrestling too many matches, and I'm sure he'd have it that way too if he could. And we finish the case off with Kofi, who I have nothing bad to say about, a pretty valuable roster member. Even back then he could be relied on to always produce a good mid-card match. Not much to say for the L's in TNA or WWE. TNA just had Low Key, a good wrestler slash warrior. WWE had Lucky Cannon, a guy who never made it past NXT. And Layla, a girl who was Michelle McCool's sidekick and was completely forgettable in the ring. Let's move on. There's a lot of wrestlers beginning with M. Call it a mixed bag for TNA though. Let's start out with the positives. Matt Hardy, a solid guy at this point. It would take him a bit more time to figure out his new gimmick, but TNA let him do it. Matt and Nick Jackson. Say what you want about them, and you probably will, but these two brothers built a brand, and that has to be respected. They had a goal and a vision for themselves, and I can respect that. Similar to Okada earlier, they weren't anything in 2011 TNA, so they weren't going to push them at the top of the card. TNA also had Mickey James, who's still going strong today, a great addition to the women's roster. TNA had Mick Foley, who I guess could be used as a draw. I don't think much of his TNA run, to be honest. I think he was overpaid for what he did. But a cool name to have in your company nonetheless. Another cool person to have was Mr. Anderson, the former Mr. Kennedy. TNA pushed him as top of the card after he left the WWE, and it worked out alright. He did flip between face and heel too much, but in 2011, a really good guy to have. Matt Boring. He could have been good. But also, he flipped between face and heel too much, and TNA was scared to pull the trigger on his main event run, which damaged his character in the long run. He looked like a wrestler, and he was probably a draw for the casual fans. Magnus was also here, but he was Nick Aldis. He wasn't that good in 2011, but he had a future, and he's shown that he's great at branding himself nowadays. He could yet still be made into a big name in AEW or WWE. I'd be surprised if they never take a chance on him. Solid tag wrestler by 2011 standards. Mark Haskins was a British wrestler who was just shoved in the X Division. It didn't go well for him. Madison Rain, Not again. Yeah, she did alright, especially by 2011 standards. 
Certainly lasted a long time in TNA. She's now in AEW as the women's trainer. And finally the man called Murphy, saving the best until last. I'm joking if you can't tell. Murphy sucked, and there's nowhere sugarcoating it. Probably the weakest member of the roster in 2011. He was mostly used as a security guard slash wrestler. I do miss laughing at the man called Murphy though. Lots of women beginning with the letter M in WWE. Maurice, Michelle McCool, Melina. She had terrible music. Yeah, those three were all fine overall. But what about Maxine? She was certainly fine. The Miz. He's great, but I just don't buy him as the star of the entire show. I didn't in 2011 and I still don't now. The good news ends there though. Mark Henry. He's been involved in way too many stupid things at this point to take him seriously. And I just found him a bit boring. Mason Ryan, the wish version of Batista. Yeah, he was not good at all. Michael McGillicutty, a complete waste of time and effort. And for the second time today, Mick Foley was also in both TNA and WWE in 2011. TNA has them beat on the M's. TNA only had one wrestler beginning with N, and that would be Nigel McGuinness. A lot has been said about him since, and he's in WWE doing commentary now, so I am happy for him. But for a brief time in TNA, he was the man before his health problems. He didn't actually wrestle for TNA in 2011, but he was still signed and did commentary for a bit, so maybe I shouldn't have included him. WWE had Natalia, who I believe was doing a farting gimmick around this time, so yet another comedy wrestler. Luckily, she wouldn't stay a comedy wrestler and she helped revolutionise women's wrestling into what it's become today. Nikki Bella, on the other hand. The TNA roster does start going downhill around this point. I've laughed at TNA so much over the years and it feels like all I've had to laugh at so far is Murphy, of the legendary cast of characters that we've all come to know and love. Orlando Jordan. He was better in the WWE. I get what he was trying to do, but his bisexual antics were just taken away from his matches too much. Most TNA fans didn't want to see him or what he was doing. ODB, a legend in the women's knockout division. By 2011, she was mostly used as a comedy figure, but I think it's good to have some variety of how your wrestlers look. Her act may have become a bit tired at this point, but let me know down below. Ric Flair, he was still signed in 2011. I liked how TNA used him for the most part as a faction leader and a mentor to the young guys. He had some funny moments in TNA and a good match and promo battle with Jay Lethal. Flair definitely had value to the roster. I just wish he hadn't had quite so many matches. No job Rob Van Dam. I reckon a few WWE fans were jealous when RVD signed with TNA in 2010. Rob is an extremely popular wrestler and TNA pushed him at the top of the card. I just don't really think we got to see RVD at his best in TNA. But he's a star so that is a win for the TNA roster. Back over on WWE we've got Percy Watson. Who? And Primo, who was fine I guess. He wasn't exactly memorable but he was pretty good in the ring and a worthy place on the roster. Now we've got some big dogs for WWE. Randy Orton and Rey Mysterio, both stars for their company, and R-Truth. I really feel like WWE could have done more with Truth. He was great around the awesome Truth times, and it felt more like the Truth we got to see in TNA in 2002. Another solid addition to any roster due to the multiple roles he could fill. Ricardo Rodriguez, yet another comedy wrestler. You know what's funny? They had so many so-called comedy wrestlers, yet the show was about as funny as a punch to the gut. Rosa Mendez, who's noted for being one of the worst divas of all time. She never improved. And another big wrestler for the WWE was Santina Morella, who is genuinely funny. He did get a bit watered down as they went more and more PG. The Cobra stuff, I can take it or leave that. But his first year in the company was honestly some of the funniest promos of all time. Cool fact, he's actually just joined TNA in real life. And we'll end on a controversial one for the WWE. Sheamus. I don't think he's ever been as good as they wanted him to be. He's just too goofy looking. I've never truly believed anything he did, but he does tick some boxes. It's not as negative as I'm making it sound. I just don't personally rate him. I found him to be boring and unbelievable. How can you be intimidated by someone with a giant ginger mohawk? It's just dumb. Just a few more TNA wrestlers to go through and we start off badly. Robbie E. He was scared of clowns. Robbie E is a clown. This was another comedy wrestler for TNA, except he wasn't really funny. He was more annoying than anything. His wrestling was also the most boring of all time. He spent half the match doing sleeper holds. Still, Robbie has done well for himself and he's ended up in the WWE as Robert Stone. Someone who has not done so well for themselves as the Welsh Roy to Rob Terry. This big muscle-headed moron was pushed by TNA for eight years based solely on how he looked. And it wasn't even a good look. He looked genuinely ill from the amount of steroids he was shoving. He muttered in a strong Welsh accent so he can't even cut a promo. And his wrestling was boring too. 
He was only slightly better than the man called Murphy because he had a look, even if it wasn't an appealing look. Unlike Murphy, who looked like nothing, things really pick up for the TNA roster now. We've got Rosita. She has really surprised me and done far better than the Hawk could have ever predicted. She is Alina Vega in the WWE, so that's a win for TNA for cultivating this girl. We've also got Rockstar Spud, who TNA hired through their British Brute Camp reality TV show. It was actually a good show too, you should check it out. After a long time with TNA, he ended up being fired and rehired in the WWE as Drake Maverick. Another very similar one is Samuel Shaw. He's now in the WWE going as Dexter Loomis. After also being fired and rehired, are you starting to see why I made this video now? All these TNA wrestlers are wanted by the WWE and AEW. He has a bright future if the WWE can just decide what the hell they want him to actually do. Samoa Joe. Not much needs to be said. A great guy on the roster and very popular, but TNA did do him dirty. He's in AEW ROH now. The Hawks' personal favourite knockout, Sarita now. She wrestled a lucha star, which we hadn't really seen much from the ladies at this point in time. She did a lot of things that I didn't even realise women could do in the ring. She really helped women's wrestling, in my opinion. She signed with the WWE in 2015 as a trainer, but got released in 2020. Scott Steiner. Of course, any roster should have a place for Scott Steiner. TNA didn't really see his worth at this point and forced him to wrestle on their Indian project Rinka King in 2011. He was great there too. When he was in TNA, his promos are of course must watch, which makes Steiner a valuable member of this roster. Jeff Hardy's stoner friend Shannon Moore was actually really good at this point in his career too. I don't think I've paid him enough respect. If you just want two guys to go out and have a great match, you pick Shannon Moore as one of those guys. And we'll end with Sharp Boy, who was just a joke comedy act, but he was a very popular one. The key with Sharp Boy is they never overused him like Hornswoggle or Eric Young. He was used sparingly, so it always meant more when he swam up. Oh no, we have some real stinkers now to go through on the WWE roster. Sin Cara, the human botch machine. I can still clearly remember the hype when this guy joined the company, and I can still clearly remember how quickly the hype vanished for him. Skip Sheffield went on to be Ryback, and he could have been good, but the internet fans ran him out of there, and I don't think he had the love for the wrestling to keep going. So ultimately, he didn't, and he was a complete waste of time, as he didn't achieve anything. Tamina is a lady I've always felt is overrated and lacking in charisma. She's fine, I guess, but nothing special, almost completely forgettable. Ted DiBiase Jr. was another complete waste of time. The WWE tried so hard to make him popular, but it almost felt like they achieved the opposite. Crowds actually got quieter when he made his way out. He wasn't particularly bad. He was just a bit of a charisma black hole, and it was also forced. He was not like his dad. The Great Carly. Give me a break. So many unfunny wrestlers on this roster. I assume Vince thought he was appealing to little kids, because I don't know who else could have possibly enjoyed this man. The Rock wrestled one match in 2011. Yeah, I probably shouldn't have included him in the roster, but he did have lots of TV time and hype dedicated to that one match, so it felt like he was there longer. WWE really needed The Rock to stick around more at this point because their show was certainly missing some electricity. And then there's The Undertaker. He also had one match that year, so why am I even talking about him? Hell, I don't know. If you remove The Undertaker and The Rock from this roster, you start to realise how weak things are. But I'm ranting and we've got some final roster members to go through on both sides. TNA, Sonjay Dutt. I find it incredible that this guy's in AEW right now. Of all the guys TNA had. Okay, no, I'm not being fair on Sonjay. But of all the X Division nerds in TNA, Sanjay was the one who struggled to connect with the audience the most. He was always great in the ring though. And the stinger, Steve Borden, is also with AEW now. Can't believe that guy's still going, and he's not half-assing it either. Tara, the former Victoria, was an excellent addition to the TNA women's division, so no complaints, and someone that could put on a good match with the right opponent. Had star power too. Tracy Brooks, another woman beginning with T. She was never good and was more of a character than anything else. She was starting to age at this point too, so it was pointless. Velvet Sky was similar, except she still had her looks. Even though she couldn't wrestle, she was extremely popular and therefore a good member on the roster. Winter, on the other hand, was painful. She was Katie Lee in the WWE and I was never able to see what anyone saw in her. Toxin was a very pointless knockout signing which saw her briefly become one of the stoner friends with Mohawks. There isn't much else to say. Tommy Dreamer is a painful one that really had no place beating AJ Styles in 2011, but it happened. I guess TNA 40 had legend factor about him. Tommy Dreamer is not Hulk Hogan. And last of all on the TNA roster, we've got Stevie Richards. I rate Stevie, I really do. He's got some good moves, a decent move set, and he can sell a character too. I'm not sure why companies didn't really take the time to build him up into something. 
But I guess it shows the strength and depth in Impact's roster at this time that they could have this guy and not use him. The real last person in TNA is Zima Ion, who's another one who's done well for themselves. He was a pretty fun guy in the X Division and was always full of energy. He got signed to the WWE in 2019 as Joe Quinn Wilder, although he seems to be lacking the energy he once had in TNA. In the WWE, we end on a bit of a mixed bag. Let's start with the positives. Zack Ryder was still trying to burst through the WWE glass ceiling at this point, but he's gone on to have a long and successful career, and he looks like he has a lot of fun doing it. William Regal is someone every roster would be happy to have at this point in his career. He should have probably gone one step up the ladder in the WWE, but his own problems derailed him at times. He was with AEW, and now he isn't. Tyson Kidd was one who was extremely exciting in the ring, and he was pushed along with Hart Smith as the Hart Dynasty. That seemed to work for them, but when it stopped, it seemed pointless having either of them. And what the hell was that ugly chunk of hair on Tyson's head? It barely existed. They were really fun in the ring though, especially enjoyed Tyson Kidd. Wade Barrett. They tried so hard to make this guy into something, it just never worked. Why was that? He seemingly had all the tools. Was he ultimately just too boring? He was for this hawk. Yoshi Tatsu. He was never going to be more than some entertaining for the little kids. Even his music sounded like something from a children's TV show. It's a shame because he could actually wrestle. Kozlov, he sucked. Trent Beretta, he really sucked. Tyler Reeks, he really, really sucked. And he stank too. Titus O'Neil, he just didn't look like a wrestler for some reason. He was just a bit bland. And Triple H, who at this point in his career is quickly losing muscle mass and hair and starting to resemble a tub of margarine. They still relied on him though for the big matches because the roster was so weak. So as you can see, there were still some decent guys on the WWE roster, but it felt like a bunch of career mid-carders and a few legit main eventers thrown in. In contrast, you just have to look at TNA's roster and it's like a perfect blend at this point. You've got the legends, Mick Foley, Kevin Nash, Sting, Scott Steiner and Ric Flair, but we aren't relying on them to have the main event matches anymore, because we've got Kurt Angle, RVD, Jeff Hardy, Slapnuts, Mr. Anderson, AJ Styles, James Storm and Bobby Roode all in the peaks of their career. You don't have to include the legends in the main event, but you can if you want to. WWE has a legit main event of Cena, Punk, Orton and Triple H. You can throw The Miz and Del Rio in there too if you want, but I'm not buying it. It's just not as exciting as the TNA main event scene. As far as the TNA morons go, you had Orlando Jordan, Anarchia, Murphy, Rob Terry and Robbie E. They only stand out so much because the rest of the roster was so talented and these guys are so talentless. So going back to my original point about how well TNA guys have done despite their so-called inferior roster, out of the 88 members of the roster I just looked through, including the comedy team, 36 members of the entire roster have been employed by or are still currently employed by either the WWE or AEW. Or 41% if you want to be all mathematical about it. That is impressive. Now let's compare that to the WWE. Out of 122 performers, only 25 are still performing at the top level, WWE or AEW. That's around 20%. That's a shocking statistic and perfectly demonstrates just how bad this roster was. They weren't good enough. TNA also had a bunch of guys who were only pushed for a month before they gave up on them, like Pope D'Angelo De Niro, Samoa Joe, Gunner, Jay Lethal, Desmond Wolf, and that's just compared to people like Ted DiBiase Jr., Wade Barrett, Swagger, McGillicutty and Alex Riley, who did all get pushed for longer than a month. Maybe if TNA committed to a push to these guys, they could have done better. WWE needed TNA. They loved their wrestlers whether they would admit it or not. They basically used it as a developmental territory. So I hope you can now understand just how OP the TNA roster was and just how respected and talented its wrestlers actually were. And I know the main question that's going to be on people's minds now. How did TNA manage to screw this up with that roster? And if you don't agree with that, I'll take your girl out for a coffee in Costa.